Normally what I do at this time is to have a few moments of silent prayer and then I begin. But I just decided to do something today uh, in response to Franklin Graham, which is Billy Graham's uh, son, had on the internet and probably other places, I saw it on the internet on a, on a, it wasn't a YouTube, it was an email. And he was calling for all the churches in America to pray today, specifically for our country and for our president, because we are in desperate straits whether people realize it or not. So I decided that I was going to answer the call as well. So I'm going to pray in that regard. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I'll just lead us all in prayer, just continuing in that prayer. I will lead us and address those issues. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we are your children because of your grace because we believed in our Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning work for us on the cross. We recognize that we're just sojourning, just passing through, visiting on this globe, on this planet. Our home is heaven. You tell us that our citizenship is there. We're thankful to be born in America. America was founded on your word the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and America is unique in that we are the first and maybe only country that recognize that our rights come from you. They are not from the government. We have God-given rights. Thousands of our brave soldiers have sacrificed and died to protect our freedom and our God-given rights from foreign countries that would enslave us. But now our freedom and rights are in grave danger, not from foreign countries, but by forces within our own country. Half of the people have believed satanic lies and turned their back on you and your word. That includes those in our Congress, our Senate, and judges in our courts. Our country seems to be hopelessly divided, and as our Lord said, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Hatred and anger has overflowed into nearly every area of our society. The news media, Hollywood, universities, government, and an entire political party. It is more than having a difference of opinions on government policies. It's a clash between worldviews. One side is trying to hold on to the institutions and values that have worked so well for nearly two and a half centuries. The other side is doing its level best to destroy them. The Bible instructs us to pray for our leaders, and they need prayer now more than ever, especially our president. Like all of us, he is far from perfect, but he is doing his level best to save our country from those who want to destroy it. He is under vicious attack from every side, every day, as he does his best to stand for truth and righteousness <clears throat> and for America. We pray that you will give him wisdom and discernment, that you will protect him from the assassin's bullet and from those who would try to influence him to do anything in which you would not approve. We pray that you will give him stamina and patience, and that he will not seek revenge, but realize that you will take care of his enemies if he just leaves it in your hands. It appears that our problem is political, but it is not political. It's spiritual. Our, cultural, our culture has become a cesspool of decadence 
and our politicians have responded to give the people whatever they demand in order to get their votes. Our fellow Christians are being persecuted, fined, assaulted, and some are thrown into prison. Respect for natural law and for the Bible has all but vanished. We pray for pastors to be like the black-robed regiment of the past. We call for Americans to stand firm for truth and righteousness and trust you to vindicate our holy cause. Let us all humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways and trust that you will hear from heaven and will forgive our sin and heal our land. We lift our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who is our living Savior. Amen. Okay, we're also going to do a little something different this morning. Instead of going back to our notes, and we're in Genesis chapter 22, we're going to go to a PowerPoint that has points about testing. You see, Genesis 22 gives the account of God requiring Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, his beloved son, Isaac. This is the ultimate test, and we can learn much from it. We'll be going back to our notes in a, in a bit, but I've extracted, uh, I think there's about nine of these PowerPoints that have information that we need to know about testing. And so, if I can bring it up here correctly, we'll begin with them. Okay. Number one, expect tests from God. We get this from Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through 2, where Abraham was going to be tested. That might seem simple, but it seems like whenever something comes right out of the blue and crashes into us, some kind of, uh, I'm not talking about literally, but I'm talking about adversity, something that is unpleasant, something that we must deal with, something that hurts something that we're going to suffer under. It's always as a surprise. Or we, we, we're not expecting it. And so this first point is important because it says we should expect tests from God. And then underneath it it says, it is a compliment when God sends us a test. It shows he wants to promote us in the school of faith. God never sends a test until he knows you are ready for it. A lot of these notes, by the way, have been have come from Warren Risby and his uh, writings. So we shouldn't look at it as something that we hate. It should be something that we regard as really a favor because it is when we are under testing that we are going to be promoted. That is, if we endure it. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life becomes much less difficult. This is from The Road Less Traveled, page 15. So why is it, again, that we are surprised and shocked when we're in a hurry and we go out and turn the key on the car and the battery's dead? Why do we hate that? Why is something as small as that just make us go into a rage? Well, it's because we haven't accepted yet that life is difficult. And not only do we realize it, we accept it. That changes things. The Bible says, just this is in Proverbs, just as sparks fly upward, so is woe to man. He's going, we're all going to face woe. What is woe? Actually, we want to put a woe to woe, don't we? Huh? Wasn't that clever? I just thought that up. <laughs> 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 the 
But it's true that we would like to do that, but it is in the woe. It's when we are having uh, testing that should be the greatest time on earth. It's the time when we're closest to the Lord. It's the time that we have great opportunity to be promoted, to receive more blessings, more rewards and decorations. So we have to change our default thinking, which is usually, I don't know about what your default word is for when something happens, Mine is, damn! I see some of you laughing. I, I take it that that's your default word, too. And, and that's one of the better ones, by the way. <laughs> so we need to change that because in Philippians, it just happened to fold into what we're studying now. We are to rejoice always. That's when the car battery goes dead and all the host of things. So if we are really on our game and we are applying what we learn, then when the car battery goes dead, the first thing we should do is say, thank you, Lord, and mean it. I mean, you can say, thank you, Lord, and it'd be sarcastic. Thank you, Lord. Number two, focus on promises, not explanations. Genesis chapter 22, verse 3 through 5. I am, I am in awe of what Abraham did. The ultimate test. He didn't ask one question. He didn't whine. He didn't complain. He didn't go seek counsel. counsel. He just did it. And he could have asked a thousand questions, but he just did it. Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, to do what seems unreasonable, and expect what seems impossible. You see, that's when most people go into depression and they get anger and they, they do everything but what they should do. Because it's under those circumstances that God is going to demonstrate to you that he really is omnipotent that he really does love you. He's trying to get you to trust him, and sometimes he will eliminate every out, everything that you can think of in order to fix the problem and leave him out of it. He's going to shut all those avenues down. So actually that makes it easier for us to trust him. We live by promises, not by explanations. Remember when Job asked God, why did this happen? I mean, Job suffered like few people ever have suffered. Did God give him an answer? Did he explain to, to uh, Job why he did it? No. What did he do? He started asking Job questions. Question after question after question. Were you there when the foundations of the earth were there? Were you there? Can you explain? Or can you have the power to keep the constellations all in place, all the stars? All? Question after question after question. By the time God was finished asking him questions, he was kind of like, kind of like this. And he, I'll paraphrase what he said. I'm sorry I asked. It's wonderful the way that happened. So, we live by promises and we don't need explanations. All we need to do is trust the promises. Point number three. I guess there's a point number three. Oh, no, there's more here. Okay, so why did Abraham believe and obey him, that would be God, when he did not know where, and these verses are or where you can find the answer or find these questions here is in Hebrews 11:8. So why did Abraham believe God and obey him when he did not know where that is where he was going? He says, "Get up and you're going to go sacrifice your son and I'll let you know exactly where later." Hebrews 11:8. He didn't know when when he did not know when that is he didn't know exactly when he would get there, this is Hebrews 11, 9 through 10. 
And Hebrews 13, and also Hebrews 9 through 10, and also Hebrews 9, 13 through 16. When he did not know, know how, he didn't know how God was going to pull his fat out of the fire this time, uh, it, it was just, he had to just trust. This is Hebrews 11, 11 through 12. And when he did not know why, this is Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I hope you get it. The reason that he was able to do all these things is because of why? He knew the who. Do I remember that? I shouldn't have told you. That's what it's all about. We don't need to have all these questions answered. Abraham didn't. All he had to do was know the who intimately, and the rest didn't matter. You don't have to know any of those in order to obey. All you have to do is know and trust the who, which, of course, is the Lord. Point number three. Depend on God's provision. Now, we're talking about all this relating to testing. This is in Genesis 22, 6 through 14. Why do we have to be reminded of that? Because we are all prone to provide our own solution. Many times we do that because we're not on the same timetable as God and we want our solutions to be now. And so we just say, well, I'm not going to wait on God. I'll just take it into my own hands. That's what Abraham did when he listened to his wife, Sarah, to go into his handmaiden and produce an heir because he wasn't waiting for God to provide. See, that's the, that's the hard part about God's provision. You can know that he's going to provide, but if you don't have the patience, if you're not willing to wait, then you're going to mess it up every time. Abraham could depend on the promises and provisions of the Lord because he had already experienced the resurrection power of God in his own body. We see this in Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through 21. How, what is he talking about? He has experienced the resurrection power of God in his own body. How old was Abraham when, when uh, Isaac was born? 100 years old. There's not a lot, a lot of 100 years old uh, men that could produce an heir like that, especially when his wife was barren from birth. So he had already experienced that resurrection power in his own life, so he knew that God could raise Isaac from the dead if that was his plan. And he wasn't guaranteed whether that was his plan or not. All he knew is that God had promised him that the offspring of Abraham would be like the star, number of stars in the sky, and they would go through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He even promised Isaac that he was going to be also in that line, would have all these tremendous offsprings, so many people from his line. And that's what he was, that's what he was counting on. That's what he trusted. Number four, we should seek to glorify Christ when we are being tested. Not ourselves, Christ. We find ourselves asking, how can I get out of this? Isn't that another default thing that we do? How, how can I get out of this one? Instead of what can I get out of? What can I get out of this that will honor God? That's what we should be asking. What can I get out of this that will honor the Lord? What can I learn? What can I do in order to honor the Lord through this testing? We sometimes waste our suffering by neglecting or ignoring opportunities to praise Jesus Christ to others who are watching us go through the furnace. Everything that I'm saying is contrary to who we are as people. So many times when we are in suffering, we want other people to know. We want them to know, boy, am I ever going through it. 
because I guess we all, to some, maybe even to a small degree, like pity. We like people to know. We don't like to suffer by ourselves. But we never suffer by ourselves, do we? If you were alone, stranded on an island, and suffering, you wouldn't be alone. Why is that? Because not, God never leaves us and he never forsakes us, ever. That's in Joshua. In Isaac's case, a substitute died for him. That would be the ram. But nobody could take the place of Jesus Christ on the cross. It couldn't be an animal. couldn't be another person. He was the only one qualified, the only one that could do it. He was the only sacrifice that could finally and completely take away the sins of the world. Now, God provided a ram... But Isaac had asked about a lamb. The answer to the question is, the question, where is the lamb, was given by John the Baptist in John 1.29. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I, when I saw the ram, I was a little confused. I don't know where you are, but I, was, I noticed that they were going to sacrifice a lamb, but God pro provided a ram. And it was purposely not to confuse a lamb that could have been sacrificed with the true lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You see all these lambs, probably millions of them, and oxen and all these animals that were sacrificed did not take away even one sin. All they did was put a cover over that sin. God would hold off any of his condemnation until the Lamb of God took away the sins of the world and that's John 1.29 the cross was the physical instrument of death but at Calvary Jesus experienced more than death he experienced the judgment of God for the sins of the world Isaac felt neither the knife nor the fire but Jesus felt both Isaac's loving father was right there, but Jesus was forsaken by his father when he became sin for us. Matthew 27, 45 through 46. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. What marvelous love. You see, this was just a picture of what was going to happen at Golgotha when Jesus Christ was sacrificed for us. Isaac did not start carrying the wood until he arrived at Mount Moriah. The wood is not a picture of the cross, for Jesus did not carry his cross all the way to Calvary. Now, I made that point. I made a, 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 a comparison of that, I think, a Sunday or two ago. But this actually makes more sense. The wood seems to picture the burden of sin that Jesus bore for us 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. So instead of being the cross, the wood actually referring to the physical cross, it refers to the sin, the burden of sin that Jesus bore on us. I want you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. I want to point something out for you. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself, Jesus Christ, bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you are healed. So it's talking about the burden of sin. Now I want you to take that word wounds, underline it, and I want to make a point here. You notice that it's in the plural. It is in your English, but it's not in the Greek. It's singular in the Greek. It should say, by his wound you are healed. 
Now, why am I making a point of this? I've done this before because when we take the Lord's Supper, I quote Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. Write that down right there so you'll be able to make this comparison right there in 1 Peter 2, 24, right in your margin. Singular, Isaiah 53, 5. Now, I want you to turn there to Isaiah 53, 5. <clears throat> and why am I making a, a big deal about this? <clears throat> Isaiah, <clears throat> excuse me, Isaiah 53, 5. <clears throat> Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. But when I quote it, when we have Lord's Supper, I quote it from the King James Version. But this is the New American Standard Version. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Now, I want you to put a circle or box, something around, scourging. First of all, this is, I think, maybe the only translation that says scourging. The King James Version, instead of saying scourging, a scourging has stripes. By his stripes we are healed. The e ESV, the English Standard Version, the NIV, New International Version and the NET, the New English Translation, and there are many more that translate this as wounds. W-O-U-N-D-S, wounds, plural. Now that word there in the Hebrew is kabura. C-H-A-B-B-U-R-A-H, kabura. And it's singular. So we have in the Old Testament here a reference to by his stripes, by his wounds. or I don't like the word scourging because it could seem like it's singular, but if you're, if you're being scourged, if you receive a scourging, there's more than one, one stripe. There's more than one wound. I don't like this translation at all, but I think the other ones are... They communicate better, but all of them have one thing in common, and they say, and they have it plural when it's singular. Now, the reason it's singular is because of this. is because this tends to make you think that our so great salvation was secured by physical torture, by being scourged, by being whipped with a whip over his physical suffering. But that's not true. There was only one stripe. There was only one wound. And that was spiritual death, because that's the penalty uh, for us. When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden, forbidden fruit, uh, they died spiritually. And that's what Christ did on the cross, because it wasn't his suffering. Other people can suffer, maybe not as much as he did, but there's been tremendous suffering throughout the world. But only one perfect person can die spiritually. And that was the wound, the stripe, the scourge. And that's important to note. So I saw this as we were going through here, and I thought that I would point that out to you. I hope you make a notation in your book, in, in your Bible, so that you will remember that. It's important. It's a way for us to emphasize the real sacrifice was spiritual death and during that time God the Father and God the Holy Spirit abandoned Jesus Christ because they, they can have nothing to do with sin. Okay, now we'll go back up, we'll look at the screen again. So Isaac did not start carrying the wood until he arrived at Mount Moriah. The wood is not a picture of the cross, for Jesus did not carry his cross all the way to Calvary. The wood seems to picture the burden of sin that Jesus bore 
for us. And we went to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. <coughs> Excuse me. And that burden, the price he had to pay for sin, was not physical punishment, it was spiritual. I mean, physical punishment, it was spiritual death. Abraham took the wood and laid it upon Isaac his son. This is Genesis 22, 6. And the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. The fire consumed the wood as a picture of judgment of God against sin. Fire is has to do with judgment. It's interesting. This is very interesting. <laughs> I say it's interesting, but I think you'll find it very interesting as well. It is interesting that Abraham returned to turn to the two servants, Genesis 22, 19, but nothing is said about Isaac when he returned. In fact, nothing is said at all. Is not mentioned again until he is seen meeting his bride in Genesis 24, 62. While it's obvious that Isaac did return home with his father, the Bible type, this is typology here, reminds us that the next event on God's calendar is the return of Jesus Christ to claim his bride, the church. So, Jesus Christ died on the cross. And, of course, we know that he was resurrected and he was on the earth for 40 more days and then he ascended. And then, as far as we are concerned, our next contact point with him is when he comes to receive us as his bride. So the fact that the Bible doesn't say anything about Isaac after his sacrifice until he's going to meet his bride is a preview of what's going to happen at the rapture. Are y'all getting that? I mean, very few people would go deep enough and find this and make it a point. But that's how deep the Bible is. And I can't take credit for this. I didn't see that. But Warren Risby did. He put it here, and so I'm passing it along to you. That's how interconnected and how wonderful our scriptures are. Point number five. <clears throat> Look forward to what God has for you. Genesis chapter 22, verse 15 through 24. There's always suffering. There, excuse me. There's always an afterward to the test of life. Hebrews 12, 11, and 1 Peter 5, 10. There's always something after the tests. Because God never wastes suffering. You're not suffering just for the sake of suffering. There is a purpose for it. And after you have endured... You depended on the Lord, and he has provided the solution, and now you are on the other side of suffering. You There's always benefits. It's not just suffering for suffering's sake. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, Strengthen and establish you. So on the other side of that suffering, this is what God is going to do for you. You're going to be better if you don't get bitter. Because that's what happens to a lot of people. They have no divine viewpoint. They don't have any doctrine to draw from. All they think, well, boy, this is bad luck. Look, and it's horrible. And I'm going to complain and all the rest of it. No. This is what's on the other side of suffering. This is also a promise. The God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What a promise. Abram, excuse me, Abraham obeyed God's will and sought to please him. And God commended him. It's worth, to, it's worth it to go through trials if at the end the Father can say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, if you had great parents like I did, 
which I do, um, they're going to train you up in the way you should go. And they're going to give you praise. And they're going to give you discipline. But the discipline is not near as hurtful as the thought of displeasing them. And that's the way it should be towards our Heavenly Father. Sure, there's discipline and we don't want discipline. But we, we ought not just to go through the testing, trusting Him and seeing Him work for us. But we want to be patient and wait on Him and trust Him and obey Him because we don't want to displease Him. Because we love Him. And that should be the main motivating factor. That's what helps us to wait on Him because we know on the other side He is going to be pleased. A lot of people do a lot of effort in human good and that doesn't please God, that displeases Him. But when we go through suffering and we call upon Him, we trust Him, we wait on Him, and we... Praise Him even during the suffering. And we rejoice through the suffering. That is what God can do for us on the other side. Here's another. We're talking about the suffering here. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made Him This is something else, by the way, that I quote usually at the Lord's Supper. He, God the Father, made Him, God the Son, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, this means as a substitute for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Isaac was going to be sacrificed. Isaac rep represents Jesus Christ, not a complaint, not any kind of uh, hesitation. He had just as much faith in God in being killed as his father had in killing him being willing to kill. He was willing to be a sacrifice. So, and Jesus Christ went there voluntarily. Ephesians 5, 2. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Jesus Christ voluntarily went to the cross. And so did Isaac. He didn't go to the cross, but he was ready to be sacrificed. Now, we've got ten minutes left, and there's a lot of things I didn't get to today. But we're, I want you to turn your Bible to James chapter 2, verse 20. Now, in James, James is going to mention Abraham. And he's going to mention him in the, one of the most controversial chapters in the entire Bible, which is James chapter 2. And I've got 10 minutes. <laughs> but we're going to go as far as we can. I've taught this, and many of you hopefully would be able to respond to someone when you tell them that salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. It's not of works. And they will take you to James or refer to James chapter 20, uh, 2, verse 20. This is our first verse. Look at it up here. That's way up high. I hope you can see it. I can't lower it. But you, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Some say faith without works is dead. Now, the, the huge mistake that people do to try to vindicate their belief that you have to work in order to go to heaven is that they take this as if it is referring to eternal salvation. We call it, they make it salvific. James had a group that he was talking to. They were believers, but they were believers that thought, okay, well, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm going to heaven. And so I'm not going to put myself out in order to do good works for other people. And so he is trying to explain to them 
that what they're doing is contrary to what they would want for themselves. And it is true in an experiential way that the faith that you had at salvation, if it lacks works, is worthless, Not, and it has nothing to do with eternal salvation, but it means you're living a wasted and useless life and it's useless in the sense that you're going to be justified before other people by men, before men, and it's useless as far as being God being justified and giving you rewards, decorations, privileges, and so forth. This is all experiential. And so I have written, after, I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of small, when it says that faith without works is useless, and I have here, in being justified before man, are receiving rewards. Now, James says that these people, these believers under him, would, as an illustration, someone would come to them and uh, that were hungry, and they would come naked, and they needed clothes, and they needed food. And they, they would say, go and be clothed, and go and be fed. But they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't help them. So what good is the faith they had when they believed in Jesus Christ? What good is their faith as a Christian if there's no works. What good is it? Nothing. It's no good whatsoever. That's the context of what is going on here. Verse 21. Y'all y'all in James? Okay. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son and I put in here as a sacrifice because we're looking at these verses that have to do with sacrifice. So was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? And the answer to that is yes. But those that work had nothing at all to do with Abraham being saved because he was already saved. Abraham was saved when he left Ur of the Chaldees. And we'll get to that. That's in here as well in where we're going. Verse 22. You see, faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Now, I have a few things in here that I don't know if you can see them that well. You see that faith was working. This word working is a verb. It's the imperfect active indicative. Now, what that means, the in that, uh, a imperfect tense in the Greek emphasizing the ongoing action in the past. So when it says, you see that faith was working over and over in the past, that it can't be referring to eternal salvation because you don't have to keep on working, you don't have to keep on having faith. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, when you have faith alone in Christ alone, that triggers the imputation of eternal life and God's own righteousness. So since it's ongoing, it can't be referring to something regarding eternal life anyway. So he says, you see that faith was working. Oh, active voice means you have to produce the work, which also, again, is not has anything to do with our eternal salvation. It's indicative mood of reality. So you see that faith was working with his works. And I just threw in there producing. Because when you have faith, and it is active, even after salvation, then that is what produces work. Let me say it a, a different way. You're not going to produce work unless you believe the promises. You're not going to believe, uh, you're not going to, excuse me, you're not going to produce good works if there's not something in it for you. And that means that you believe the promises that God is going to give you super blessings and he is going to give you rewards in heaven. If there's no motivation for you to do good works, you're probably not going to do them. So this is talking about even faith after salvation. We have that one spot of faith which we are eternally saved. But then after salvation... We continue to use faith 
And that faith in God's promises and in the doctrines that we've learned motivate us to produce good works. So that's why I put, you see, that faith was working with or producing his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected I have or, or completed. So when you're a, a baby believer and you don't know much about the Word, you don't have enough information to really utilize that faith that much. But when you grow in grace and knowledge and you're learning doctrine, then it's important to apply that doctrine, and you apply that doctrine because you believe the doctrine. You believe the promise. So in that case, faith is active in producing good works. If you don't have any doctrine, if you're not motivated to do good works, are you going to be a, a big good works producer? And of course, all these good works have to be produced under the filling of the Holy Spirit or it's just human good anyway. 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. So when Abraham sacrificed Isaac on the altar, was he a believer? Of course he was a believer. He already had righteousness reckoned to him. This verse, I have notes below that is going to explain this, but I'm telling you now. And as the scripture was fulfilled, this is in scripture which says, and Abraham believed God and it was uh, believed God and it was reckoned to him or credited to him as righteousness. That happened in, back in Ur of the Chaldees and it is quoting that verse. It's, in other words, what I'm trying to explain is that Abraham did not have God's righteousness credited to him when he sacrificed Isaac. He, had, he already had that. And so a lot of people think, well, yeah, he got it then. No, he was already a believer when he left Ur of the Chaldees. And then it says, and he, and, he, and he was called the friend of God. Now, the fact that he sacrificed Isaac, or was willing to, he was going to do it, means that is the reason he was called the friend of God, because his faith, produce work because he believed God that Isaac was going to be an heir and even though God called him to kill him, to sacrifice him on the altar, he knew that, or he, he believed that God would bring him back. And it was that trust and acting on that trust is what is why, one of the reasons why he was called a friend of God. Are y'all getting this? Y'all are as stoic as an anvil out there. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to make it exciting. I'm trying to make it understandable. And these, these, this portion of scripture is is the mainstay of Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and others who will come right out and say, "Oh yeah, you got to work your way to heaven." And they'll go to these verses to substantiate it, and I'm putting them in context for you. And then we have this. Verse 24, this is our last one, and we're out of time now anyway, but I'm going to end with this one for today. Verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works, and your translation probably says, and not by faith alone. Is that what yours says? Okay, if you look close up here, I cross that out. See where it says, by faith alone? And at this late time in this message, I'm not going to go into the grammar and the morphology of these things, but I'll just say this. This is not, in, from, the, from the Greek, this, it can't be by faith alone. <clears throat> alone is an adverb trying to modify faith. Faith is a noun. And adverbs don't modify nouns. So this is incorrect. And so I crossed it out. And 
put it this way. You see that a man is justified by works and not justified only by faith. Now you have only the adverb who is that is modifying a verb here, justified. Now that is grammatically correct in the Greek. What, why does that make a difference? The difference is because it would sound like that you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. It sounds like there's only one kind of justification, and that is by works. But it's not that. There's two kinds of justifications. There's justification, there is justification by faith alone in Christ alone, which is eternal salvation. We're justified before God by faith. We're justified before man by works. And that's what James is talking about. That's what he's giving out. And so this, here you have, you see that a man is justified by works. That's one kind of justification. That's justification before man. In other words, if you say, I'm a believer, and they say, well, that's great. Why should I believe you? Well, if you have a, a lot of good works, then they will tend to believe that you are a son of God. But you, they can't see the faith that you had at salvation. The only thing they can see is your works. If you don't have works, then you can't be justified before them. So justified by works is by before man and not justified only by faith. So we're, we're justified by faith, but not only by faith, we're also justified works before man. Now, in this amount of time, that's all I can do. But I hope you go there you, and, and write this. I, if, are you all here in James right now? All right, I want you to write this. Cross out faith alone. That's not even, not even in English is that grammatically correct. Especially in Greek. Because it sounds like it's only one kind of faith and that's by works. You see that a man is justified, I could put in here, by man, I mean to man by works and not justified only by faith. That's two justifications. One by faith, justified before God. One by works, justified before man. And if you're justified before man for works, it means that God can justify giving you super grace blessings and rewards and decorations and so forth. Ah... Uh. I can read y'all usually, but I'm not doing it today. I have no idea. I think, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm not going to tell you. You won't, you won't come back. <laughs> and now you're curious, so now maybe you will. <laughs> okay, so... Um, we're so We're so dubious in making a sacrifice of ourself, aren't we? When Christ sacrificed his all voluntarily. So, remember those points, they'll be on the website, since the website is working now. I'm going to have to filter these into my notes somehow. These are all on PowerPoint. But we'll be able to manage that. Okay, let's. Uh, I'm going to close with giving the gospel as I usually do. Because all of this is superfluous. It doesn't mean anything if you're not a believer. So here's the good news. This is what we need to be telling people. You can tell them in your own words, but this is the basis. This is the framework of the good news, and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went to the cross for the sins of the world. So that doesn't leave out anyone. He was the only one qualified to do it. And he died on that cross, both spiritually and physically, he was buried, but he rose from the grave. And now he offers eternal life to anyone who will trust him and him alone for it. That's the gospel. And either you're going to accept that or you're going to think, no, I'm going to, I'm going to keep working my way. I don't trust that just because Jesus Christ went to the cross and the Bible claims that he paid for our sins and anyone who believes in him is 
born again. I, I, that's, I, I'm going to believe in my own works. Well, if you believe in your own works, there is no salvation. And as we're talking about these works here, uh, we're going to see that they cannot buy salvation. Abraham was already saved. So that's the good news. And in a moment of time, you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust in his work on the cross for eternal life, and you will receive it. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have in the word. We thank you for the country we live in. We want to keep it. We pray for our president. We pray for those leaders who stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and for truth and for righteousness. We pray for them. Our only hope is in you for our country's survival. We need to pray about that and we need to stand firm and give the gospel and be good and faithful servants. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.